there and doodle, but what he was doodling was about four decades ahead of his time, and physicists would wait to see what he had doodled on his napkins and what have you in order to see just exactly where his mind was going and what they could learn from that. A brilliant man who flunked math in second grade. That's the only thing I share with him. I flunked math in second grade. And my dad got upset. It was a long story. He did better the next time. Now, evolution is taught in all public schools and presented in the media not as a theory but as a fact. Evolution explicitly contradicts creation and because it tacitly denied the uncaused cause, which is, of course, God. Another contradiction of evolution to, the, to creation is when it requires long periods of time, precluding God from calling into immediate existence by his own power and will and choice, creation under his own time frame, which, as St. Basil says, and St. Gregory of uh, Nisa, okay, and various other saints who postulate the following, God had no need for time. He created time. God had no need for creation to take time, worldly time, to come into being. For them, they understand God in the famous Ex Saimiron, the six days of creation that St. Basil wrote. They understood that when God willed for creation to come into being, boom, in his way, the immediacy according to God, creation comes into play. There is no need to say that the first period, as some say, was billions of years old. And you'll see, probably not tonight, but maybe at the next meeting, why if the world is truly billions of years old, we'd have the moon, according to things as they stand today, sitting on us. But the moon, as you know, gravitational bodies, you know, both attract and pull on each other, right? I'm going into something, but... The moon actually moves something like four centimeters, about just under two inches a year, a little further from us. If you back that up, uh, 1.4, I think it is, a billion years, the moon is sitting right in the middle of, I don't know, I suspect New York. Everything else is big about New York. But regardless <laughs> of that, <laughs> but it would certainly cover from here to, you know, the rest of uh, this hemisphere. The point is it wouldn't be. If, in fact, the world was that long in existence, you would also find that creation had to take place below freezing, which is not exactly something that fits with scientific theories as they stand today, and many other things. Let's leave that go. In, 19, in the 1920s, the Tennessee legislature, having heard about Darwinism, of course, passed a symbolic statute prohibiting the teaching of evolution. The governor signed it, but he felt that this is something that would never need to be enforced. Well, don't talk to think. A case was engineered rather quickly. A former substitute teacher named Scopes, who wasn't sure if he'd even ever taught evolution, chose and volunteered to be the defendant. That is to say, yes, I taught evolution, so try me and am guilty and convict me and whatever have you. The case became a media circus, even then, I guess, the media, which Time magazine about 20 years called the media the fourth branch of government. And I very much think that they were profoundly on target to say, long before courts and juries and legislatures and even executive branches really have an opportunity to look at something, the media has already tried. The media has already decided. And the media has already influenced the thinking predominantly of people. And therefore, in essence, is kind of like a, how do you call it, blind copy of the fourth branch of government affecting how we see things. Most people who I meet from Europe tell me the following thing. The only thing you can be sure in the United States is that what you see in the news is not the whole truth is not exactly the way things are. I remember during 9-11, a certain person had called from Greece. And in Greece, they were seeing things that we didn't know was going on while it was going on, and I lived in New York, and they were telling me. Well, anyway, the case became a media circus event. 
colorful attorneys were involved. William Jennings Bryan, a three-time Democratic presidential candidate, you can imagine the media that followed him, who was the former Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson, led the prosecution. But it turns out to be a major mistake for him, and I'll show you why. Bryan was a Bible believer, but he was not an uncompromising literalist. That is to say, he didn't believe every single word of the Bible. He thought that the days of Genesis were not necessarily 24-hour periods, and there was room, latitude, to play with the interpretation. He opposed Darwinism largely because he thought that its acceptance had encouraged an ethic, ethic of ruthlessness and ruthless competition that would underlie the evils of German militarism and robber baron capitalism. The Scopes defense team was led by Clarence Darrell, a former lecturer, famous lecturer and criminal lawyer. Darrell maneuvered Bryan, a foolish thing, into taking the stand as an expert witness on the Bible, and then he summarily humiliated him on the stand. Having achieved his main purpose, in essence, that the prosecuting attorney didn't understand at all the case that he was making, Darrow admitted that his client had violated the statute and invited the jury to convict him, in other words, taught evolution, and then there was a big $100 fine levied, which the Supreme Court later on of Tennessee, of course, removed. The principal spokesman of the theory of evolution was a Henry Fairfield Osborne. He was the director of the Museum of National, Natural History. Osborne relied heavily on the notorious Piltdown Man fossil, now known to be a complete fraud. He was delighted to confirm the discovery of a supposedly pre-human fossil tooth. A tooth. The paleontologist Harold Cook was the one who proclaimed this tooth. The tooth was discovered, discovered to be a tooth from a peccary, which is a pig. You may laugh. You go to the Natural History Museums and you see from a tooth the artistic license taken by evolutionists teaching our children and teaching our people. Seeing a fish with legs and whales with wings and archaeopterigo, I can't even say it in English, the first winged animal, which supposedly is purported to be the wings having come out of the scales of the, some amphibious thing that both swam and, and walked the land. The National Academy of Sciences, representing the nation's most prestigious scientists, stated the following. Creation science is not science because, now listen to this if you can carefully, it fails to display the most basic characteristics of science, reliance upon naturalistic explanations. Instead, proponents of creation science hold that the creation of the universe, the earth, living things, and man was accomplished through supernatural means inaccessible to human understanding. Interesting. Uh -huh. Because creationists cannot perform carbon dating on God, I guess they're not sufficiently confused by people like St. Spiridon, who should have decayed 1,600 years ago, St. Sava the Sanctified, St. Dionysius, and, and, and just profoundly so many of the saints, we don't even know them all. They just uncovered one in Greece not too long ago. And I remember in 1993, when I went to the Holy Lands with a group of people, they had just uncovered a monk from a grave, and he was an incredibly, it looked like they buried him yesterday. Romanian Orthodox monk. We saw his relics at the monastery of Elijah the prophet. I'll never forget those things. It was just something brand new right there in front of you. Therefore, creation science is thus manifestly a device designed to dilute the persuasiveness of the theory of evolution. The dualistic mode of analysis and the negative argumentation employed to accomplish this dilution is moreover antithetical to the scientific method. This is the most insulting statement. You need more faith to believe in evolution, forgive me for saying such a statement, than you do to believe in Genesis. 
And the more we uncover these things in something like this video and what have you, the more you're going to see that what I am saying is not just a, some priest, you know, shouting out from a pulpit statements. We're talking about scientific proof to creation. But because creation immediately implies the word creator, scientific evidence, which is hard fact science, is not admissible in a court of law. But it's okay, it's okay to take a dozen fossil samples and throw 11 or 10 of them out because they don't date according to what the scientist expects to find. But the one that they claim fits their model, that one becomes the whole fulcrum by which the theory of evolution should stand. We don't understand what's going on. The basis of godly fear and godly respect and godly understanding and, and, and just acceptance of how did this world come into being is being constantly and severely undermined. People say the world is changing. Is it? It depends on what you mean by the world. The less you have a presence of God in your mind, or when you are about to sin, and then you say to yourself, or you think to yourself, especially as our children are learning, this is how the world came into being. My uncle, the ape at the, at the zoo, you know, he didn't understand what he was doing back then. And I just came from him and, you know, going according to my senses. Survival of the fittest and enjoy the mostest. Well, that's affecting our people. It's affecting our children. It's affecting generations. It's a serious thing. The worst thing is, to me, give evolution its due. But give creation also its due. Just the scientific evidence. No need to speak a creed. But science demands all of the evidence or it is not science. Don't you tell me that we build these buildings, that we go to the moon based on 50% or 25% of the evidence. You are kidding, right? Absolutely not. We need to know it all. Well, that means also we need to understand if we're going to purport how the world came into being. And by the way, did anybody ever ask, how did we find out about Genesis? Was it not the Archangel Gabriel who appeared to Moses and taught him what to write? There were no video cameras. There was nobody there. Adam wasn't created. Eve, we found out from God. The greatest footnote to Moses is G-O-D. God. And these things are blown off as if they are nothing. Well, listen to a couple more things. I better begin because it's going to get late, even though I have another set of pages that I will do it the next time. With such definitions, the Academy advocates of a supernatural, supernatural creation may neither argue for their own position nor dispute the claims of scientific establishment. Did you understand that statement? Probably not. Even I had difficulty reading it. <laughs> 